Welcome back to part 20 of the Gospel of John here on Growing in the Gospel. I'm Pastor Kerry, and you've clicked play on a long-form teaching series called Jesus Up Close. We're just going through the Gospel of John verse by verse, piece by piece. Today, we're at the end of John chapter 6. We're going to study a message called Rational Jesus, Why Jesus Makes the Most Sense. And we're going to see Jesus come into confrontation with the religious philosophies of his day and explain who he is and how he triumphs and trumps them all. And so I believe today we'll equip you and help you and encourage you. So John chapter six, let's press in to rational Jesus. Is there anybody in the room that has ever gone paddle boarding? Wave at me if you've ever gotten up on a paddle board. Okay. I've had occasion this summer to do some paddle boarding. I started last summer doing it occasionally, and I really enjoy it. There's something about getting out on the water. It's peaceful. It's, it's, it's good exercise on a nice day, especially a hot day. And uh, the last several weeks, I've had opportunity to be on different occasions, a couple different times, on a paddle board. Okay, the first time was uh, uh, kind of in a calm bay that kind of wrapped around a piece of land, and then there was kind of open ocean. And I, I took that paddle board out. It was a little windy, but this was a solid board. It was a strong, sturdy board. And I got out on the water. And when you're standing on a, on a strong surface on top of a tumultuous surface, it's, it's not so difficult to, uh, to, to get your balance, to find stability. And I paddled that board uh, around the, the tip of the, out where the Atlantic was. And that, when that open water, when you hit that paddle board, that open water, it was a whole different game to stay on that board. But still, it's, it's pretty uh, steady and stable and it's firm. That's the key, it's firm. All right, well, uh, it's a lot of fun. And I was out there. Dana didn't really want me to be out where I was because literally sea turtles and stingrays and uh, several sharks swimming by. And it was just one of those kinds of adventures, you know? And she's like, what, what about Steve Irwin? I said, he didn't know what he was doing, you know, and, and he, just for the fun of it, you know. But uh, anyway, so uh, the, the more recent occasion I was uh, for a little while on a paddleboard, it was an inflatable paddleboard. Anybody ever been on one of those? Okay, so here's the key. Well, I, let me just tell you what happened. I uh, was all confident, because after all, I've paddleboarded on the Atlantic, you know, partially, and now this is just a lake. It's a piece of cake. This is like training wheels, okay? So I, I throw this thing down on the water, and I get out there, and I'm on my hands and knees on the board, and I push off from the dock, and I get out just about three feet, and I'm trying to stand up, and boy, it is, in, the water's real calm, but the board is incredibly unstable. It's inherently wobbly, and I'm, it's kind of freaking me out, because I'm only in that deep of water, so I'm thinking, I'm going to break a limb or something if I, or my neck if I fall in, you know? So I tried to stand up, but it was incredibly unstable, and I realized this board is not inflated enough. And so I quickly got back to the dock, I pulled it up, got a pump, pumped that thing up, which was in itself a workout, got it really nice and, and firm, really a lot of pressure, put it back on the water. And here's what I learned, okay? You can be on unsteady water if you're on a solid surface, but if you're on an unstable surface on top of unstable water, you have double trouble. You guys with me? You have like instability on top of instability. All right, so here it is. Why do I tell you that little story? Because we live in a fluid world of instability. Like that's where we live. Planet Earth is unstable. Um, and we've experienced that, we've seen it. We are, we are fragile, the world is fragile. Uh, stability is fragile, it's hard to come by. All right, but here's the problem. Most of us have ignored the part of our lives that stand, not, not most of us, I should say many of us, uh, in the world, most people, it's kind of what I was driving at, most people ignore the part of their lives that would give them a middle layer of stability or durability or strength on top of an unstable ocean called life on planet Earth. So planet Earth is unstable already. It's not going to get any better. It's going to continue to get worse. Life itself is fragile. We've all got an appointment with death. We have no idea when and where that is. And so we then try to layer instability with an alternate kind of instability, you know, insurance and predictable careers and a stable economy, a new president, another new president, another new president, another, you guys can't, you know, we, we put in place all these solutions in our lives, in our homes, in our society, and, and essentially what we're doing is we're putting 
another layer of instability and fragility on top of one that's already unstable. And we wonder why are we always dealing with persistent exhaustion, anxiety, and fragility that even subconsciously plagues us. You think about it, we never really have enough. We struggle to find and sustain happiness, joy, purpose, meaning. We make decisions, we're just prone to this, we make decisions that end up being uh, painful consequences and outcomes and sometimes even self-destructive or hurtful towards others. We never really feel better for very long, circumstantially. If we get what we want, it doesn't make us happy for very long. Now we gotta worry about losing it. Um, if the economy's good, we worry about it being bad. If it's bad, we worry about it being bad. You know, like there's never an answer. And it's kind of like uh, if, you know, you, you, you eat a good breakfast, but you're hungry again by noon or one or two, or you eat a good lunch, you're hungry again by dinner time. There's this, there's this uh, hamster wheel cycle that we all run on that's fueled by anxiety and exhaustion and just the inerrant fragility. We really, really struggle to find rest for our souls in all this. Our, our souls are looking for that. They're looking for something stable, but we just really refuse. We, we really uh, don't find that, that rest, and we refuse, and here's the, the biggest problem. We really don't like the idea of death at all. We just don't want to even think about. We, we, don't, we feel invincible. The older you get, the less you feel that way. Um, but we feel like just, life just kind of goes on forever, and it really doesn't in this body, so we've all got this appointment with death. Now, before I get you too depressed, um, Jesus really wants to rescue you from this vast emptiness and this vast, this deep instability. When we come to John chapter six, which we are going through the gospel of John as a church family, just, just section by section, we're taking it piece by piece and learning about Jesus. And I wanna give you the context before we jump into the story that's before us today. The context is that the Jewish people living in John chapter six, first century Israel, had a very similar life to the life you and I have. Now, circumstantially, it was different, I get. Historically, culturally, the, 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 there's nuance. But I'm talking about fundamentally, the problems are the same, were the same. They're living under, they're living in their own land under oppressive governance, Roman tyranny, um, which is oppressing them. Just surviving in their culture was hard. Just getting enough money to sustain next week, just getting enough uh, crops and herds and grains and, and food just to, just to get by, catching enough fish to, to feed ourselves tomorrow. It was hard work just to survive. They, their world, political tension was pervasive. It was normal. C uh, civil and societal unrest was normal. There were regular uprisings against Rome and different sects and zealots of, of Jews trying to uh, set things up differently and, and force the power out. There was, there, were, there was rioting, there was murder, there was mayhem. All of this stuff was very common in their society. They had, uh, they had the word of God to some degree. They had the promises of God. They believed in God. They were supposedly God's people. And there was this promise out there of a Messiah, which is an unfamiliar word to us, but it's just, in their minds, it was a deliverer, a political leader, a new political leader, a new president. And Messiah was going to fix all the political problems, all the, 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 the justice problems, all the oppressive, pr oppressive class issues. The Messiah was going to make all the food free, all the electricity free, all the gas free. Everything was going to be free. There's going to be plenty of everything. He was gonna fix everything that was wrong with their country, and so they couldn't, they were really excited about Messiah because he was gonna fix everything and give them back their nation and their political ideals. Now here's what they wanted for Messiah to do. Get, get this, you gotta get this in your mind. They wanted this coming Messiah to be a conqueror. They wanted him to go to war. So their mantra, their, their motto, their aim for him would have been go to war, fight Rome, destroy the enemy, save our nation, repair our economy, and give us free stuff, and make our lives easier and better for the rest of our lives. Now the problem is, Jesus is offering, offering them in John 6 and offering us something better than what we want. 
Jesus offers them and us something better than just what we want. He's offering what we all most need. He's offering what we all most deeply need. Now, as you come to John 6, and if you have a Bible, open it. If not, the outline has all the scriptures you can follow along. John 6 is a sad chapter. And I wanna show you why real quick, and then we're gonna pick up where we left off last week, okay? Verse one says, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee. So after these things refers to Jesus finding out that John the Baptist, his friend, his cousin, his co-laborer, was dead. So he's lost a loved one and he's grieving. And he, and he takes his disciples and he wants solitude. He wants to get away so he can pray, so he can be with his friends, and so he can grieve. Kind of like you and me when we're grieving. We just want to pull away and grieve. Well, it doesn't go that way. What, I just want you to hold that thought. It starts with grief, but look at the end of the chapter. I want you to see verse 66, and it's really 66 to the end kind of, kind of explains this, but verse 66 is everything that John is building to is right here in this verse. It says, from that time, now we're gonna talk about what happened at this time. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So at the beginning of the chapter, you have grieving Jesus, and at the end of the chapter, you have abandoned Jesus. Masses of people have walked away and deserted him. Now what happens in between verse one and verse 66? Well, in snapshot, Jesus, when he goes away, masses of people follow him to a hillside. He spends all day, instead of grieving in solitude, all day healing supernatural transformation of people, literally miraculous intervention, healing people. At the end of the day, they're all hungry, and he materializes enough bread and fish uh, for uh, enough filet of fish sandwiches for 25,000 people to eat all they want, okay? Uh, and they all do. They're all full. They're all like, wow, this guy can make food. At the end of that account and that situation, Jesus sends the disciples into a boat across the sea. This is coming towards the uh, evening now. He goes up into the mountain to pray. Last week we studied, in the middle of the night, the disciples are stuck in a storm on the sea. The people are, have all headed back to their home across the sea. Uh, Galilee is what we're talking about. And uh, Jesus came to them walking on the water in the really early hours of the morning, like 4 a.m., 5 a.m., he comes to them walking on the water in the middle of this chaotic storm. They've rowed the boat for eight hours. They've gone four miles. They're only three miles from home when they started, and they don't know where they are. They're somewhere on the Sea of Galilee because it's been black all night and a storm's been raging, and they just barely survive. Jesus walks on the water, calms the storm, and transports them immediately to the shoreline where they were going all along. We studied that all last week. When he gets to the shoreline, he gets to his hometown, his home base, I should say, of Capernaum. Now, what we're gonna do for the next few minutes is talk, through, we're just gonna read through the story. We're gonna pick it up in verse 22. So number one in your outline, if you're following the outline, is understanding the story, okay? If you're used to a, like a five minute homily, <laughs> you're already upset at me, okay? Uh, so hang with me, because what we do at Emmanuel is we get into the Bible and we understand it okay, and why it matters. And this could be absolutely transformational to you. If I could just insert this, I was eight years old at a children's program very similar to what you just saw. My parents sat in a service similar to this, and they made a very critical decision. And because of that decision, the whole trajectory of my family, my brother's families, for decades changed. And it changed in a moment. And maybe Jesus wants to bring you to that moment in the next few minutes. So let's understand the story. And the first thing I want you to see, beginning in verse 22, is uh, that the, the people are seeking Jesus for a, a, with a personal agenda. Look at verse 22. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save the one the disciples were entered in, that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, Howbeit other boats came from Tiberias, nigh to the place where they ate bread, after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they, took, uh, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Now, I want you to look at the screen. I'm going to throw up some photos to give you some geographical bearings of what we just read. 
okay? So they're on a hillside. Uh, so this is the Sea of Galilee, and we're going to zoom in. Boom. This is the north part of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus' uh, home base is right here, Capernaum. They've taken the ship across to this area, which is the Golan Heights. That's where the feeding of the 5,000 occurred. All the people have gone up there. Now, Jesus sent the disciples back through the storm. He goes up the hill. All the other people jump into taxi cabs and go across the ocean back home, okay? Because uh, all the Uber boats showed up, knowing the people were there. So they jumped in and went home because they realized Jesus isn't here, the disciples aren't here, we're gone. Because they only want Jesus, all right? Uh, because, and we'll find out why in a minute. The night has gone. Um, the storm, they're lost somewhere out here. Jesus comes, walks on the water. Immediately they're here. So now we're going to zoom in to Capernaum. This is today Capernaum. This is the ruins of the excavation of ancient Capernaum on the shore of Galilee. So that's what it looks like. So I'm going to uh, go a little closer now. We were there a couple years ago. We'll have 53 people there in a couple of months. So these are the excavations of the homes on the shore of Galilee. This is looking across to the hills where I was just talking about. Um, go to the next photo if you would. So now we're really looking at those hills. This is the shoreline. It's very rocky. Um, and this is, was this just simple first century fishing village. Next picture. Uh, this is the synagogue that Jesus taught in on this day. So everything we're going to read that Jesus says in this chapter, he's standing in that synagogue when he says these things. And he's talking to these people. So the people, though, um, and I want you to, uh, you can go back off the photos now. I think that's the last picture. Yeah. I want you to go back to verse 24. When the people saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they took to shipping and they came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. Here's what I want you to remember. They're not seeking God. They're not seeking a, a, a big picture Savior, an eternal Savior, someone who will rescue their souls. They're looking for someone who will give them more happy meals more Lunchables. They're looking for someone who will fix the economy and fix their political problems. They're looking for a new president. They're looking for someone they can command and control. And that's what's wrong with this situation. In fact, in an earlier verse, they tried to take him by force and force him to be president. So in this predicament, you have people trying to command Jesus instead of willing to be commanded by Jesus. Now, this is a fundamental reversal, and there are some religious structures out there that kind of teach this, that God is uh, kind of subject to the whims of your faith, that he has to, your faith is like a force, that's a magic force, and if you have enough, you can force God to do what you want. You can force him into your plan. And that, that, that idea upsizes our, us in our minds, and it downsizes God, and it compresses him into a little lamp, and whenever you need it, you rub it, and he pops out. And then you ask him for your wishes, and then you make him go back into his lamp. And that's not God. That may be a genie, but that's not God. And that's certainly not Jesus. And so these people are not really believing in Jesus. They're following him for fickle reasons, which we'll see now. I want you to see, secondly, that they are idolizing the material, and they're completely neglecting the spiritual. Look at verse 25. When they found him, oh, they finally found him, finally. Hey, can you give us some of that bread and fish? Can you, can you whip up some of that water and wine thing? Can you uh, heal my buddy? Can you fix my cousin's foot? That's all they care about. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to them, Rabbi, th this is funny, watch their attitudes, watch their, watch their, uh, their snarky, um, bristly attitudes towards Jesus. This is man interacting with God, okay? And listen to what they say. Rabbi, teacher, when camest thou hither? When, who told you you could come here? When did you come back here? Who gave you? It's almost like who gave you permission? Um, Jesus says, verily, verily, truly, absolutely. That's kind of an emphatic statement. I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. He said, you're not seeking me because you love God and want truth. You're not seeking me because you want to ground and, and build your life on what is true. You're not seeking me because you want salvation and forgiveness and reconciliation with God. You don't want God. He says, you want a full stomach. You want your bills paid. You want little circumstantial material things. But look at what he says. He, keeps, he continues to indict them. Um, 
he says, I'm trying to find my place here. You, you saw the miracle, you, 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 were, you were filled. Verse 27, here's his instruction. Labor not for the meat or the provision, the food, which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So Jesus says, you're spending all of your energy, you're laboring hard for things that are going to corrupt and be lost and break, broken, and everything you're pouring your life into is temporary. Everything is temporal. It's, it's perishable. You're giving all of your best life to things that are perishable. And he says, I'm come to give you something that's unperishable. And by the way, I've got the God of heaven has given me his approval, his seal. They had heard the voice. This is my son. Hear him. This is my son. I'm well pleased. So Jesus is confronting their, their myopic focus on here and now. Their, their little problems. You have little problems and you have, a, you have big problems, okay? Your little problems are material and financial and circumstantial and familial. Your big problems are spiritual. And you can go your whole life, your whole life, only at your little problems and never address the big ones. And you'll have plenty of little ones. I mean, because when you neglect the big ones, then, then the little ones just multiply and multiply like, like spider nests. They just, you know, like anthills. But when you begin to address the big ones, the spiritual ones, and you put those as your priority, you cultivate the big spiritual values. The little ones, they become fewer and fewer and fewer your whole way through life. Now, I'm not saying they ever stop or go away. Jesus didn't promise an easy life. He promised a stable, durable life. He didn't promise no waves. He promised stability on top of the waves, and he controls the waves. Okay, so they're neglecting their spiritual problems. We're tempted to do the same and go only at the little material problems. Jesus, Jesus is drawing their attention to their big problems, their spiritual problems. I came across a story um, this past week from, uh, well, it was about a man that was in London years ago in England, and he was a young man. He was on the fast track to, to the top of his profession, his career. And there was a, an older man in his life, about 30 years older than him, that had gone up the same trajectory in that career, extremely successful. He accomplished everything he aspired to in his career and more. He was a model, he was a mentor, he was fabulously successful and wealthy and, and lived the dream life materially and circumstantially. Well, one day, the older man came to the young man's door and he knocked and he said, can I come in and sit for a while? I just need to get away. I need a place to sit quietly. The young man said, sure, let him in. The man walked in and he sat down on a chair in front of the fire and he didn't say a word. He sat and stared for two hours. The young man who deeply admired this older mentor, this incredible model of success, realized what was happening in the older man's life. The man had fallen in love with a woman who he lost. He, uh, she had passed away recently. And on top of that, the man was aging, and, and every career has, an, has a rise and an arc and a, and a decline, and the man was completely unprepared for age and for decline, and so all the things he had anchored his heart and his hope to, his soul to, and all the years and years of spiritual neglect suddenly came crashing in on him, and he realized for all of his success, for all of his wealth, and here's what the young man said, I watched as my mentor and hero sat staring into the fire, and I suddenly realized Realized he had no answers to the only important questions. He said, I realized he'd lived his whole life ignoring his spiritual problems and never getting answers to the most significant questions. The most significant questions, my friend, are not what will you eat tomorrow or are we going to go to the picnic or not or, uh, or what's up next week? No. Or where do we go on vacation? The most significant questions is, is there a God? Did he create you? Uh, where did you come from? Where are you going? What's wrong with planet Earth? What's wrong with me? How will I be made right? Can I know God? Can I have a relationship with him? And how? And, and the big question, where do I go after I die? That's the big one. That's the most important question. So Jesus wants to get their eyes on the important questions, okay? I want you to see in verse 20, uh, 28, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 28, Jesus now, um, well, they, they turn their attention to 
their response. Verse 28, then they, the people, said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Now, here we're going to see the one thing God requires of us. This is a critical question. This is a question that is worthy of your time right now to deeply consider, okay? These, but I want you to understand the question before we see Jesus' answer. The people say, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Now, they're not saying, we love God like you love God, so how do we serve God well? What does he want us to do to please him? That's not what they're asking. They don't think Jesus is God. They can't even conceive of God becoming a man. So so that's not even a category. Jesus to them is a man, nothing more than a man, but he can do some pretty cool tricks. And they're like, you you gotta have tapped into something from God to be able to do these tricks, these works, okay? And so they're saying, teach us how to do what you know how to do. We wanna be able to make fish and bread. We wanna be able to manufacture feet and eyes and ears. Teach us these medical tricks. Teach us these, what do we have to do to do what you do? Okay, have you ever had, have you ever had a magician do a trick up close in front of you? What's the first thing you say after the trick? How'd you do that? And that's what, essentially what they're asking Jesus. Tell us how you do this. Why, because they want him as God and need him as savior? No, they want food. They want stuff. They want their political arrangements. So Jesus is gonna give them an honest answer though. He's not gonna teach them to do tricks. He's gonna tell them what the heart of God wants from every human being. What does he say? Look at it. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that you, what? Believe. Now the world is full of religions that say, do this, do this long list of stuff and God will be happy with you. In fact, let's step back a little bit and let's just look at all of our options when it comes to faith. Your first stop on this journey of faith is secularism. Secularism says there is no God. Um, We got here by accident. We evolved from nothing. Everything that is was created by nothing. Life spontaneously generated and made you. It's all an accident. So place blind faith in this theory. By the way, it is not a science. It's only a science if it's observable, and that's not observable. So it's purely a theory, and the whole world is buying into this crazy theory on blind faith. There's no evidence that substantiates this. It's guesswork, okay? It's guesswork. And now listen, you're betting everything on it, which makes it a religion. You're putting faith in it, which makes it of of a spiritual nature, I'm betting everything, I'm banking everything on this narrative. So secularism offers you no hope whatsoever. Heck, secular, secularism says stop even hoping. Don't waste your energy. All right, which brings us second to philosophy. Philosophy says there is no God like secularism. And then it says turn inward and look inside your heart and find your true self and, and fantasize and make up and construct whatever reality you want. Don't let anybody tell you what's real or true because it's only true if you say it's true. So you can create your own self, you can create your own ideals and your own world and your own morality and your own gender and your own sexuality and you can just define it all for yourself because it doesn't matter and that is a dead end road of oppression and depression and hopeless despair. You're free to take it, but it's a, it's a bad road. It's a self-destructive road. Secularism is hopeless. Philosophy is hopeless. Both of them say save yourself, create yourself, invent it yourself. Religion comes along and says, wait, 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 there is a God. And in that respect, most religion gets it right there. There is a God. And, and religion, secondly, says you have offended him. Well, that's true. We're all sinful. We've all broken God's laws, so we have offended him. But this is where the narrative goes bad in religion. Religion says now since you've offended God, you must work hard to recover his love. He doesn't love you until you're good enough to be loved. And that's conditional love, that's cheap love, that's not godly love. That's self-centered love. So religion gives you a self-centered God that's kind of uh, forcing you into a taskmaster-driven life to be good enough and, and you kind of live with a 
deep anxiety. Even if you believe in him, you're just anxious over it. You never really know whether he loves you or not because you don't know if you've been good enough or not. And it's a hamster wheel of anxiety and fear. It's a terrible thing. You're betting all of your soul's destiny on your achievement. So it's still a save yourself narrative. Well, Jesus steps into that first century Israel and today in our lives. And here's what Jesus says. I am God, number one. And he says, you could never be good enough to save yourself. You could never be that good. So don't even try to work your way up with some religious ladder or system. So then he says, I came to you. I came from heaven. You're going to see it in a minute. I came from heaven to you because I can never get to God. God came to me. And he says, and my salvation is received, not achieved. I came to give eternal life. Do you realize how many religious structures in the world says you can, say, you can have eternal life, but if you earn it? And Jesus steps in and says, forget earning it. You never could earn it. I want to give it to you. That's pretty big. We call this good news. The word is gospel. Listen, if somebody's version of the gospel says to you, you have to be good enough to get God to love you, that's not good news. That's advice. That's not like celebrative, that, that's like hard work. Get to work, make yourself better. Good news is, you can never be good enough. Jesus knows you to the depths. He knows everything wrong you've ever done, but he still loves you and wants to forgive you. And he wants to give you that forgiveness. He wants to grant it to you. He, he, it's a gift. So the gospel is truly good news. Because in a, in, in a framework that says, I can never save myself, what hope do I have? Jesus comes into that and says, you have no hope but me because I will be able to save you. Well, let's keep, let's keep reading. The one thing God requires of you is belief. Belief, we'll unpack that a little bit more in a minute. Hang with me, you're doing, you guys okay? We're, all, we're, we're doing good, okay, I'm gonna hurry. But look at the people, they're refusing to believe. This is amazing. They said therefore unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it was written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Let me tell you what these people are saying in verses 30 and 31. Prove it. Now here's what's so ridiculous about that. He's just spent, in the last two days, hour after hour after hour, doling out hundreds upon hundreds of miracles, healing people, everybody that came to him he healed, and then 25,000 of them, he, fi he filled their bellies with, with a great meal. They've seen the supernatural over and over and over again. They have seen plenty of evidence. But when Jesus says, believe me, they fold their arms, they cock their heads, and they go, prove it. Show us another sign. Do another trick, circus boy. That's what they're saying. What sign are you gonna give us now? And then they say, Moses fed us with bread from the dead. You know what they're saying when they bring Moses? Moses is their epic historical deliverer model. Messiah is gonna be like Moses. Moses led them out of Egypt, okay, and gave them manna in the world. God gave them manna, but they think Moses gave it to them. So here's what they're saying. You only fed us once. Moses fed us every day. You catch it? Yeah, they remember the feeding on the hillside. But what about today? What about tomorrow? And what about, you know, what about like Moses? They're refusing. And listen, there are people in the world, we call it unrepentant unbelief. They could see all the evidence imaginable and still go, prove it, God. Prove it. But listen, I'm a believer in Jesus, and sometimes I wake up and put Jesus back on trial too. The thing about Jesus' earthly ministry, he was, on, he was always on trial. There were always people around him saying, prove who you, prove it, prove it, prove it. I'm not gonna believe unless you prove it. And the problem is, so unbelievers are that way. I'm not gonna believe in God unless he can prove himself to me. Prove it, prove it, which he already has. The fact that your heart is still beating and he's still mercifully waiting for you to turn to him is epic proof. But then as believers, we, we tend to wake up sometimes and we look at our circumstances and we get upset at God and we put him back on trial and he doesn't deserve that. That's why a lot of the people at the end of the chapter walk away. The fact that God doesn't behave the way I want him to does not make him worthy of unbelief. 
It doesn't make him worthy of rejection. It doesn't give me justification for walking away. No, the fact that he doesn't behave the way I want him to simply means he's God and I am not. If your God always agrees with you and does everything the way you want him to do, you don't have a God, you have an idol. You've created a false God in the image of yourself. A God that's bigger than you will act in ways you don't understand and you have to be willing to accept that. Hang with me. He didn't, that little guy didn't like something I said. <laughs> He's not the first. The irony is they wanted bread. The irony is when you get Jesus, you do get his promise of care and provision. Seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. But knowing Jesus and following him is really first about your soul. It's, it's about tragedy proofing, death proofing your soul. It's about being durable even when life doesn't go the way you wanted it to. In verse 32, Jesus describes that real life, not short term circumstantial, but real life, eternal life is a person and a gift. Look at what he says. Then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. That was kind of a slap in the face to them. I'm greater than Moses, and, and I belong to my father, and he belongs to me, and, and he's going to go even further in a minute. The bread of God is he, me, he's saying. The bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Eternal life is a gift from heaven purchased by Jesus in his redemption, his work on the cross, Listen, he came and received your judgment and mine so that we could receive his life, his forgiveness, his truth into us. And then he goes further and calls himself the bread of life. Now look at this. It's an epic statement. We'll dive deeper into it next week. Verse 34. Then said they unto him, Lord, they're so disingenuous. Well, Lord, give us ever more of this bread. Like, Come on, what are you waiting for? Give us the bread. Speak it into existence like you did on the hillside. They're not saying save us. They're not saying forgive us. We have violated. We're ostracized from you, alienated. They're not talking about their spiritual needs. And then Jesus rocks them to the core, verse 35. He says to them, I am the bread of life. Let me break it down. I am is a title, a name for God in the Hebrew Scripture. So to us, it doesn't mean what it would have meant to them. In the Old Testament, when Moses said, who are you? God said, I am. That's one of my names, I am. So Jesus, through the Gospel of John, repeatedly says, I am, and then he, he's claiming deity. It's huge. He's saying, I'm not just a good teacher or some man or religious leader, I am. And then he says, I'm the bread of life. If you want real life, if you want abundant life, if you want eternal life, you're gonna find it nowhere but Jesus. Only Jesus gets you off the hamster wheel, gives you soul life, gives you soul salvation, gives you the answers to the big questions. So we, we wrap up with this, responding to Jesus. Responding to Jesus. What happens in this situation? And how do we, how do we bring it forward and get our soul off the hamster wheel? How do we deal with our spiritual needs quickly before we go to this picnic? My friend, if you listen, Give me five to seven or eight more minutes, you can pillow your head with great peace, even as the world around us is falling apart. Okay, so 36. Believe or disbelieve, that's the question. Praise, thank, thank you, Lord, thankfully, the question of going to heaven, living forever, having a relationship with God has nothing to do with can you be good enough. So, Erase that question. So many people I ask, if you died, where do you think you would go? And a lot of people say, I think I'd go to heaven. We, we're so, we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. And if you go, okay, so on what do you base that conclusion? 99 out of 100 people go, well, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good. So listen, in our psyche is woven this idea, I can be good enough to save myself, and I am good enough to save myself. And Jesus comes into the picture and says, 
you could never be good enough, and no, you are not good enough, so erase that from the equation. Your only hope is if it's a gift. You can't work for it. All you can do is receive it. You do not achieve it. How do you receive it? Believe. Look at verse 30. 36. I said unto you, you've seen me and believe not. So Jesus knows who's believing and who's not believing in this scenario. And he says, you people won't believe. By the way, he still fed them and healed them, even though they wouldn't believe. That's, that's unconditional, pure love. Verse 37. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Jesus says, anyone that believes, anyone, and God knows who's going to believe, this is what he's saying, anyone who believes, once they come to me, they're secure. They can never be lost again. We call it eternal security. I will never cast out someone that genuinely comes to me. Verse 38. I came down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me, and this is the Father's will which sent me that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again in the last day. Jesus says, hey, anyone that comes to me, anyone that God gives to me in faith, in belief, I'm gonna hold you and I'm gonna raise you up on the last day and you're gonna have what he calls, he calls eternal life. Look at verse 40. And I want you to consider quickly the eternal implication of this message from Jesus. Jesus continues, this is the will of him that sent me that everyone which sees the Son, so God has a purpose, a will, that everyone that sees Jesus, and in your case, that hears of him from this passage. So you get to see him right before your eyes in, black, in, in, in print, okay? So everyone that sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, I'm gonna do an illustration I like to do around here. Uh, I've done this a number of times. I'm going to borrow the piano bench, and I'm going to talk about the word belief, okay? Um, how many of you believe this piano bench can support my weight? Do you believe it? Okay. If I say I believe the piano bench can support my weight, that's mental assent. I'm not trusting the piano bench. I'm just objectively looking at it and going, yeah, I believe that piano bench can support my weight. And when a lot of people I talk to say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, that's what they mean. They don't mean that they're in Christ, on Christ, trusting him. They mean they get it, like, yeah. And they think that's what it means to be a Christian. That's not a Christian. That's someone who just agrees that there's a God and that Jesus came and died on the cross. It's a mental assent, okay? It's never gone from head to heart. It's never gone from mental assent, casual mental assent, to core heart belief. So, some people step into it and go, okay, I'll, I'll. So is the piano bench supporting my weight, yes or no? No. So this is kind of like, some people, they're trusting a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of something else, some other religious system. I, I talk to people literally like, oh yeah, I, I, go, to, I go to Buddhism, I, I, I meditate, I'm into Eastern mysticism, I'm Catholic and Baptist and Presbyterian, and I go to Episcopal, you know, I'm all of it. And they're like, I'm trying to cover all my bases. It's like, they're not sure which God is real, and so they, you know, they're trying to, they're dabbling, you know, they're, 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 they're partially. Some people think this is being a Christian, this is not. This is not core belief. To, to, to place core belief in this bench, I would have to stand all the way on it, rest all of my weight on it. Now, am I trusting the bench to support my weight? Yes. When you ask, if I asked you, what are you trusting for the salvation of your soul? What are you trusting to forgive your sins and give you eternal life and a relationship with God? Most people say, myself, my good works, I'm good. Some people say, well, I was baptized and I'm being pretty good, so that should cover it, right? Listen, core belief that Jesus is talking about is I reject every other ideology and philosophy, I reject my own good works as a source of salvation, and I'm placing my faith in Jesus alone. Because only he went to the cross, only he bled for me and took my sin on him, and only he can take my judgment and give me his life in exchange. And we call it grace because it's a gift. 
and you receive it by believing. And the moment of belief is the moment you say, Jesus, I'm all in on you. I'm trusting you. I'm receiving you. Now, many in the room have made that decision, and many would testify it's the best decision they've ever made. Right? <laughs> Where are you guys? Come on. I, I, I like fastball down the middle right there. I mean, like, it's the best decision they've ever made. Yes. You guys are still a little slow. Bacon, bacon. I mean, come on. Work with me here. All kidding aside, and I, I, I love levity. Everybody knows that. But this is life and death. And, and that's why I take a message like this very seriously. When I was eight years old, my mom and dad sat in a service like this and said, we want Jesus in our lives and in our family. And I, that's an unspeakable gratitude in my life. I don't, I don't know what kind of disaster of a life I would have uh, had they not made that decision. So this comes down to you. What do you decide? If you're a believer, I encourage you, act in belief. Act in belief. Wake up every day believing. Don't put Jesus back on trial every day. Don't ever let there be a verse 66 in your life. And then you turned and walked away and walked with him no more. If you've never made this decision, or if you have any doubt or wonder if you have, listen, look at these verses. John 5, 24. Jesus, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life. How simple can it be? And shall not come into condemnation, but will pass from death to life. Look at Romans 6, 23 on the screen. The wages of sin is death, what we all deserve, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. Look at 1 John, same author, years later. This is the record of it's true whether I want it to be or not, God says. God has given us eternal life. It's free for the taking. It's a gift. And this life is in his son. It's not just give it to me on my terms. It's give it to me on his terms, and that's in his son. He that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son hath not life. It's real simple. When I die, the question is not how good or bad I was. The question is what did I do with Jesus? Did I reject him or receive him? It's, that's the simple question. Look at this verse. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, core belief, that you may know that you have eternal life. That is the word of God to you. Has there been a moment when you made this decision? If not, if so, live in it. If not, why not right now? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this powerful passage. It's, it's, it's abrupt, it's confrontational, it's raw a little bit, but it's true and, and it's wonderful and it's rational. It, it makes more sense than any other option on the table when it comes to the big questions. Well, friend, if there's never been a moment in your life where you placed your belief in Jesus, right now could be, should be that moment. There is no better time and this is the only moment you know for sure that you have. And so I encourage you to bow your head and heart right now and receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you've done that, then keep yourselves in the love of God. Jesus is the solution. Jesus is the triumphant King. He wins in the end. And so walk with him. Trust his truth. Rest in his presence and follow him with every step of your life. You'll never regret it. Thanks for joining me for part 20 of our Gospel of John study. I'll see you in part 21.